Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the title of my talk is, uh, this, uh, is also the title of a proposal that we also put into the uh, PIP program that Mark just uh, mentioned. This is work that I'm doing with my co-PIs, Kathleen Carley, Christian LeBeer, and Mark Orr. I'm at IHMC, um, and we've also involved uh, researchers from Carnegie Mellon University and the University of uh, Virginia. And um, our proposed grand challenge is really around the development of novel computational theories and models of information flow, human behavior, and the transmission and evolution of pathogens. And our work uh, draws upon research from a variety of fields, mostly centering around the cognitive sciences. Um, so it involves research on social and organizational systems, online social media analysis, machine learning, natural language processing, with a big focus on how to pull that all together into um, computational cognitive modeling of people. Um, this is sort of an outline of the kind of work that we have been doing and the kind of center that we're trying to pull together. Um, we uh, collect data from a large variety of sources, including online social media and um, polling data that has been made publicly available. Um, we're looking into uh, the kind of research that Mark is talking about, where we want to employ uh, mobile platforms to collect uh, not only social distancing data, but also ecological momentary assessments of what people are doing and what they're thinking. And from all of these data, um, we're de uh, developing a variety of analytic methods to infer the perceptions, attitudes, beliefs, and intentions of people in different geographical areas. We use that to seed something that we call psychologically valid agents, which are based on a computational neurocognitive theory that I'll talk some more about. And uh, the aim of that is to really try to understand the behavior response profiles of people in these different regions. That is, given the current state of the world, how are they social distancing? How, are they wearing masks? Are they making decisions to, uh, to vaccinate or not? And so on. And those agents go into a kind of synthetic population or agent-based model in which uh, the main thing that we're trying to predict is the time dynamics of these behaviors. Uh, mostly we've been focusing in so far on mobility, predicting mobility and predicting mask wearing. And of course, all of that is related to uh, case rates and death rates as Mark was uh, indicating. Um, what I'm gonna focus in on is a very thin slice through this that focuses in on this idea of using computational cognitive models to uh, make inferences about, um, about people's decision-making. Um, I'm gonna focus on this because I think it's probably um, novel in this space. We are working with a computational neurocognitive theory called ACT-R. This is a theory that's been developed for some decades now. It is partly a theory of how the mind works and it's also a theory of how it is implemented in the brain. So it uh, covers a, a large variety, hundreds of experiments in cognitive psychology, uh, but also makes predictions uh, about uh, the functioning of the brain. Uh, for example, fMRI data and EEG data that's collected as people do various kinds of uh, tasks. It's been used in application in the development of uh, cognitive tutoring systems. It's been used a lot in human computer uh, interaction. Um, underlying these models are a lot of very complicated uh, dynamical equations that I'm not gonna go into, but they cover things like how memory works, how forgetting works, how practice and, and uh, uh, habit formation work uh, and so on. Um, and this, it's a, a, a unification of all these various aspects of cognition into a single theory in which we can do simulations. So um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna focus in on uh, a subset of the mechanisms that are involved in decision-making uh, that come from this cognitive theory <laughs> that come, that are uh, sometimes called instance-based learning or memory blending. And this is a particular kind of decision-making that we think we frequently see in people doing real-world decisions where they are making decisions based on a generalization of their memories and experiences of previous uh, situations. 
Um, and um, this primarily leverages the cognitive mechanisms that we know around memory. So how information decays in memory, uh, how rehearsal increases the retention of that, uh, uh, those memories, how priming works. And uh, it leverages a variety of cognitive mechanisms that are involved in uh, what are, what's called pattern matching. That is how memories uh, are retrieved in accordance to how they match the current uh, situation. And also this mechanism called blending, which essentially generalizes over these experiences to produce kind of the best result for the current uh, situation. And individual biases in decision making result from the fact that people have different kinds of experiences in the way that these cognitive mechanisms uh, actually work. And so to give you a thumbnail sketch of how, how the theory works in the simulation, the idea is every experience, every message goes into uh, memory as what is technically called a chunk. And a chunk is just a, a unitary thing that captures the features of your particular experience or memory and stores that away. And of course, over time, you have lots of experiences that might be interrelated with respect to some situation or some decision. And at the time that a new decision is, is needed, you perform this kind of memory, very quick memory retrieval that essentially generalizes and summarizes all that past experience based on the likelihood that it would be retrieved in this particular context, as well as the similarity and the intersimilarity of the, these experiences to the particular situation um, that you're making a decision about. So um, we use these mechanisms to model attitudes and behavior. And this is not very standard fare for how this, uh, this kind of modeling has been done in this community. And so this is a rather novel application to try to make predictions about people's attitudes and how it influences behavior. Um, and Attitude theory really comes from social psychology, and there's lots of attitude theories, but here's just a canonical theory to give you an idea of how it works. The idea is that your behavioral decisions, whether you're going to wear a mask or socially distance, are influenced by what are called intentions, and your intentions can vary in strength. And those intentions are related to your attitudes towards the likelihood that an outcome is going to happen and the value of that outcome. It's also influenced by subject, subjective norms. What are other people doing? What do other people think about what you're doing? And it's also related to uh, what's called perceived behavioral control or what's often called self-efficacy, which is your belief or confidence in your ability to do something. So those things combine to uh, make predictions about attitudes and uh, in the implementation of, of behaviors. We implement this using this set of mechanisms called instance-based learning, where the basic idea is you have a bunch of uh, experiences that are positive around some behaviors, sometimes negative. You're getting social information. You're getting messaging information. And at the time that you have to make a decision to exhibit, a, to execute a behavior or not, that all those pieces of information and memory and experiences are being combined to, into that particular decision to, for example, wear a mask or not. And here's this kind of a, a, a toy simulation just to kind of give you an, a sense of the impact of messages and experiences on intentions and decision-making. So this is just uh, a toy simulation in which we assume that there's no real value that you place on mask wearing, but then you get messages at discrete points in time that say it, it's highly valued. Those messages get store, stored as chunks and they influence your uh, inferences about the subjective value of wearing a mask. And if the cumulative effects of those messages and the timing of those effects of messages impact your overall intention and your expectations, and then that has an impact on your decision making about whether to execute that behavior or not. <clears throat> Just to go through another thing that influences behavior, this notion of self-efficacy, um, the idea is that you build up confidence every time you positively execute uh, a behavior. Um, when you think you may not have enough confidence or you may have some difficulty, you might put additional intentional effort in. And so over time, um, as you do something like wear a mask or socially distance, 
your self-efficacy builds up, the amount of additional intentional effort that you have to put in goes down, and overall, the probability of that behavior goes up. So how does this all combine in some phenomena that we see in, um, in things like mask wearing in reaction to uh, COVID? One of the things that we have been modeling uh, specifically is this idea that your awareness of, uh, of what's going on in, um, in the pandemic around you and the messages that you're getting through mass media and social media have an impact on your awareness of the state of, uh, of the pandemic. And then that modulates your behavior, which then in turn modulates the transmission rates, this uh, effective transmission number. Um, however, there's delays in, um, in how this all propagates. So there's a delay between the point in time that people get infected, that the, uh, the symptoms become apparent, to uh, fatalities, and then to our awareness of all of that. And that results in, in a kind of uh, oscillatory dynamics that you can see in the data themselves. So <clears throat> this is the effective transmission number in, in 10 carefully selected states here. Uh, and what you see is that this is over the first three waves of uh, the COVID pandemic, that there's this you know, huge spike in transmission that is then brought down and kind of oscillates around one. And um, our simulations can reproduce that kind of oscillatory behavior. In the lower right corner there is kind of um, a phase-based diagram where the um, infection rate at time T is then related to uh, uh, the probability of people wearing the mask, the idea that people uh, wear a mask in reaction to their awareness that things have gotten worse, and then they may back off of that when they think things are, are getting better. And uh, one way to think of this is it's kind of like a, a pendulum is swinging back and forth, and that as, it, as the pendulum swings in one direction, there's a behavior that kind of pushes it back in the other direction, and then when it swings in the other direction, there's a behavior that pushes it back towards the center, which causes it to kind of oscillate around this uh, effective transmission number of one. Um, now, when you look at the data, it's actually a little more complicated than that. So this is the same kind of phase space diagram where we're looking at the, uh, uh, the, the uh, RT values at uh, one point in time related to the RT values about two or three weeks in the future. And you do see this kind of oscillation around uh, one, but there's also this kind of spiraling where it kind of is also moving up upward a little bit. And um, if we look at the actual relationship between transmission rates and people wearing masks slightly ahead in the future, we see an even more complicated picture where um, there is this kind of oscillation that as RT values go up, people seem to wear masks, which brings it back down and it oscillates back and forth. But it's also overall increasing, again, over the three waves of COVID, such that people's reactions um, by the third wave are that when RT values go up, they almost immediately start to wear masks and more people wear masks. And we believe this is kind of a, a reflection of the fact that there is this kind of a learning effect that people are exhibiting, which fundamentally kind of rely, it goes back to this notion that people are building up self-efficacy and they're also building up some habits around how to, how to do that, which is perfectly captured within uh, the model. So that's just one of the phenomena that we're looking at. We're looking at uh, many other aspects of how people behaviorally react to information in their environment. Um, this again is just um, showing these data in a slightly different format. The top two uh, graphs there show the RT values across 3,000 counties over the first three waves of COVID. So the top left there is the first and second wave, and you can kind of see that they all center around one um, and are basically the same across those two waves. And you see the same pattern as you go from wave two to wave three in that top right uh, chart. But then if you look at the, the charts below, this is um, the, uh, the percentage of people wearing masks over these three waves. And you can see as you go from wave one to wave two, mask wearing goes up dramatically, and then a little bit more when you go from uh, wave two to wave three. 
Okay. So um, we're doing uh, additional work, as I said, predicting other kinds of behaviors. We're looking at mask wearing, social distancing, and now we're, we're turning towards um, an, analysis, uh, an analysis of vaccine attitudes and decisions, as well as people's attitudes towards alternative treatments besides vaccines. So we're looking at um, an analytics around vaccination discussions in mass media and social media segmented geographically across the United States using a variety of machine learning and natural language processing to identify these beliefs, attitudes, and also very interested in credibility judgments about how people perceive the sources of this information, and then pulling that all into these psychologically valid uh, agents that are built uh, in ACTAR. And that's it. Thanks.